Hello, hello. We are back at book club. Book book disco, I should say. I named it that way because it was like, I also have a dog here in my eyelash. Oh, it's like, oh, welcome to, you know, book. It's like a party of a book club. Get it? I book love club? That. that was the pun. Um, we have lovely Steph with us today. Um, <laughs> Stephanie Bookish, ghosty emoji, leaf emoji. <laughs> <laughs> What if people talk like that? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd be able to handle it. <laughs> I need my Wi-Fi to stay alive. We have um, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow that we're going to be unpacking, chatting all about. And like 10 minutes ago, I sent Steph um, a link of book discussion questions that I found, <laughs> which I will also send in the chat just so you can have them. But they do contain spoilers. So if you haven't read the book all the way through, maybe don't open this link. Just so you know. Um, we may or may not use that. I don't even know if that link worked. Best of luck to you. Um, <laughs> how long it is. <laughs> I know. Like, why is it that long? It just is like tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get into it, do you want to talk a little bit about your channel and who you are and the types of books you read, all that good juicy stuff. You know, when somebody asks you anything about yourself and you suddenly like don't even know who you are anymore. Yeah, and tell us a fun fact. Oh, like, we're, like it's the first day of college. <laughs> Icebreakers were never my strong suit. Um, <laughs> I am Stephanie from Stephanie Bookish. Um, I read everything. I think most people know me as somebody who reads a lot of fantasy but I pretty much read anything and everything if you tell me that you think I'll like it I'll probably read it um did you say some of my favorite books is that what yeah, yeah. okay um I let's see I love the Greenbone saga that is my favorite series of all time I really have discovered a love for Robin Hobb recently um, but I love all things horror too. Like Tanana Reeve Dew is one of my favorite horror writers. I really like Stephen Graham Jones. Um, the push really messed me up last oh, year. The push is crazy. <laughs> I think about the last line of that book all the time. All the time. I yeah, I didn't know if it would make it on my favorites list. And then I realized that I read it like earlier in the year last year. And I thought about it probably once a month yeah. since reading it. <laughs> that book is a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll read I'll read anything really. Nice. I feel like I'm the same. It's like someone commented on like my best of the year video and was like, You read so widely. I was like, I just read what I like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it on purpose. Yeah, I think that you and I bonded at one point um, in being one of the few people in our friend group who regularly reads nonfiction. Yes, that's yeah. right. Because I love memoirs. Yes. Yes, love a good nonfiction, love a good memoir. Oh, yeah. Any good nonfiction recently? The one that I always recommend because <laughs> I literally was like making dinner, sobbing into the dinner and Jared came home and was like, are you okay? And I'm like, I just finished this book <laughs> is heavy by Kiese Lehman, which oh, I did see you post about that. Yeah, that is like the most heart-wrenching book. Basically, he's talking about his experience of being a black man in the South, um, but also being in higher education in the South oh, and um, what that looks like. But also he's kind of unpacking this relationship with his mom. Uh, so it's written almost like a letter to his mom. And he's talking about his struggles with her, um, but also how resilient Black women in the South are um, and how much respect he has for black women in the south because they made him the man that he is and also there's like an another underlying aspect of him dealing with losing and gaining weight over the years and like how that has affected him as a person so mm -hmm. the the title is a double entendre because it's heavy as in the topics are heavy but he's also talking about weight 
So it's, I don't know, it was really good. It's small, but it patches, packs a punch. Tiny but mighty. Yeah, that's going on the list. You immediately, immediately sold me. <laughs> uh, add to cart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, lots of good things. I feel like in general, we have similar tastes. Um, excited to unpack Tomorrow X3 with you. I know we have some friends here with us. Christina's here uh, in the future and, and the past. Past and future, <laughs> not the present. <laughs> um, Mel is here. I know she read this book and loved this book. Um, so I'm excited for your, your input also. Jan is here, also read this book, had a good time with this book. Hi, Jan. Nice. Um, tell your silly goose hello from another silly goose. I still <laughs> forgot to wear my sweatshirt. I think I, I, think I washed it. Um, it's covered in dog hair. Joey, <laughs> Joey and I accidentally ordered match. I'm guessing matching sweaters. Matching silly goose yeah. <laughs> uh, Yes. So we are uh, alumni classmates from SGU. I love that. Um, for tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, what do we do? We want to start with ratings? Sure. Rip off the bandaid. What did you rate it? I gave it a solid four stars. Me. Two. Okay. <laughs> wow, this is gonna be so interesting. <laughs> same, same. Um, loved it. Thoroughly enjoyed myself. Mm -hmm. uh, just didn't quite have the the sparkle that I wanted it to have. Um, yeah, I struggled with the first like thirty percent of this book. Yeah, the beginning, I guess, is probably my least favorite also. Like, mm -hmm. I have really appreciated the way it opened, like, getting to know them as kids and the backstories and everything. But it did, I, d I did, like, take a little bit of time before the momentum kicked in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I just felt like the whole time I was just waiting for, like, the extra little punch. And I just didn't quite get there. I think for me something that I really enjoyed about it was like the novelty of it being about video games without it mm -hmm. being a, a sci-fi inside a video game. Yeah. Um, but it, that wasn't enough for it to be like, oh, it's the only book I've read, like a literary book about video games. Therefore, I'll just give it the five stars. Yeah. I don't know. I loved it. I loved it. It just wasn't quite a, a to be top fave, weirdly. I really thought it would be. I think something I've struggled with the last couple of years, especially being on booktube, is that I love listening to people's reviews of things, but I think sometimes it sets me up for false expectations and that's not their fault. It's me. Right. <laughs> and so sometimes when people tell me that they felt a certain way in a book, I, and especially when a lot of people say it, I expect that to happen. And then when it doesn't, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Was it? Yeah. Uh, I gave it a five. I think it's because I listened to the entire thing. I don't know if I would rate it so highly if I read it physically. The audiobook was really good. I did a blended situation because mm -hmm. once again, the person that I am in the final hour today, I read the last 50 pages. So, you know, it's fine. And yesterday I read the majority of it. <laughs> so I read <laughs> Like physically and audio, audibly, audiobook over audiobook. <laughs> and um, yeah, the audiobook was a good performance. It was very immersive, helped with all the pronunciation and all the people and everything. It's interesting because um, it's funny that we gave it the same rating and we read it so differently because, for whatever reason, I think because I was struggling with the first 30%, it took me like two weeks to actually finish this book. Um, but once I got into it, like once I got past that 30%, I like, I think I read the rest of it in a day, but mm -hmm. the first 30%, like it took me weeks to, I kept putting it down and then coming back to it and then reading other things and then coming back to it. So it's funny that we still had the same rating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I read it entirely in the last 48 hours, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, I guess I just, purely had to push through it on a on a deadline so i just was like well whatever I'll just <laughs> um but it did it was a bit slower to start mm -hmm. silly goose we need to come up with like a a hand signal or something um 
but we're still <laughs> using it today. A little yeah. Yeah. I have I have a uh, sweater in my cart. I don't know where it's from. I'll have to look. And it has like a duck on it, and it says "Get that bread." And I just really want it. <laughs> I also want it. I also want I'll send it. it to you. <laughs> The same shop that I ordered the Silly Goose University sweater from, I got a bunch of stickers. And one of them is a frog with a cowboy hat and a banjo. And it says, I have to get sillier. And I was like, this is, we live in a simulation. Like this is like, (laughs) someone created this sticker knowing that it would be purchased by me. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Love a frog moment. The first 30% in setting the scene was tough and everyone I know sped through the last half because OMG. Yeah, the last part of the book was definitely my favorite. I agree. I was shocked. I mean, it's not that I didn't see it coming because of the way they were setting it up. But when it happened, I was like, is this for real? <laughs> right. Are we, we're really committed to like this particular <laughs> twist. Okay. <laughs> I want to read this, but haven't gotten there yet, but couldn't resist. Well, hello. We the spoiler chat. Yes, we will tell you before we get to spoilers. <laughs> you definitely should read it. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you. So because I didn't <laughs> cry. I didn't either. I just, either. It's one of those books where I was like, things are happening that should be making me cry. And I just feel a little bit like a robot listening. Like, mm, yes, the literature. Wow. Look, <laughs> That's look, me, literally. <laughs> It's me all the time. Actually, um, it's funny that Jan's here because I was just thinking about her vlog where she read We Spread and was sobbing at it. And I picked up and read it, I don't know, like last week or something. And I was prepared to sob. And, you know, a little tear trickled, but I didn't sob. And I was like, damn it. (laughs) I was ready. If the time comes, silly goose had to report for duty. (laughs) Appreciate it. Some parts dragged on. Honestly, the pacing, maybe that was my missing star. Just like I needed a little bit more immersion at some points and a little bit less at some points. Yeah. Saturday. Also great. But what, am I dumb? What would the duck... Why is the duck connected to Saturday? Or is it just a pun? Ending? That's why I was sitting there looking at it because I was like, I need to know what the pun is, but I feel stupid right now. <laughs> Do we, is it just that we like ducks? I don't know. I hope that's what it is. <laughs> <Please advise. laughs> Do you think you would have read it at the same cadence had you not had a hard deadline? I think I would have. Um, yes. Because just the kind of the first opening chapters, there's also a lot of flash forwards in the first chunk of the book where they're, they're like, it's like the part of the book where they're kids, but there's a couple flash forwards, like interviews or whatever later in their life. And then we don't really get any of those, I don't think, as like the rest of the book went on. So just kind of getting the lay of the land, I think I would have taken my time a little bit more. Um which isn't a bad thing. It's good to feel like you're sinking sinking into it, but you know. Yeah. I didn't get those stickers. Yeah. Don't know what to tell you. You know, it's the the alumni perks. <laughs> <laughs> How far am I willing to take this bit? Probably way too far. <laughs> yeah, I'm in it. I knew it was coming. Hoped I wasn't the few books that made me cry last year. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure if they were fully going to commit to this, which we will talk about fully uh, later on. But um, yeah, I was surprised with the way that it all kind of went down. Same. The audio really immersed me. Gotcha. Gotcha. The concepts and discussions, but I didn't feel whole, not in a good way, but still gave it five stars. Gotcha. A lot of my patrons love the pioneers part, but that was your least favorite part. Interesting. I didn't like it either. I got very confused for a second when I was reading it. I was like, are we in a video game right now? Or what are we doing? (laughs) That was one of my favorite parts. Okay. (laughs) But I like reading it was like, 
like I enjoyed that experience of being like, what the fuck is happening? I'm confused. I am excited about being confused. And I could see how that would piss you off also. Yeah. Um, this reminded me though of of the games, which one sounded like the most fun that you would want to play? Hmm. Well, I'm a big Animal Crossing person. So I feel like the maple one would be like my jam. Okay. Yeah. But I kind of want to play that stupid Emily one. <laughs> Emily Luster. Yeah, that's a, a niche answer. That's good. That would be fun. I think my answer, my basic answer is Ichigo. Because that just sounds like the game most similar to the games I normally already play. Mm -hmm. But I also would want to play that uh, the one that they got like terrible reviews for both sides. Oh, yeah. That I thought would be really fun. I feel like I would play them all. But yeah, the, I think the maple one just feels more like what I've been into recently. But like, I don't know. I just love video games in general. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was going to ask you too. Like, do you consider yourself a, a gamer? I'm a gamer. A gamer <laughs> um, girl. <laughs> yeah, I'm a gamer girl. Um, yes, yes, and no. I think I used to be more of a gamer than I am now. Like, I, I don't talk about it very often, but like, I used to be real hardcore into World of Warcraft. Um, I also used to work at GameStop for a time when I was a teenager. So like I <laughs> played a lot of video games because of that. And then I kind of got out of it when I um, got, when I transferred to a four year because I was just like so overwhelmed. Like I didn't even read, I didn't really play video games. Yeah. Um, and now that I'm done with all my, you know, education, cause I'm not doing that ever again. Um, <laughs> I've been really into my switch and like cozy games. But I also love a little Zelda moment. So, mm. yeah. Yes. What about Zelda you? Moment. Um, kind of similar. Like, I grew up loving games and then got to college and was like, I don't have time for games or books or anything. Um, and then after college, got back into books and back into games. And then since Wes and I have been together, it's like uh, two or three years ago that you built this PC for me. Couple couple years ago Something like that. I was like a switch and laptop kind of gamer girl um and then a couple years ago he's like happy birthday I'm building you a pc um so that's that awesome. was the best thing ever because <laughs> now I can actually handle like the heavier duty games and stuff which has been really fun so I've kind of pushed my comfort zone on a lot of games yeah um, games that I never thought I'd play like <laughs> shit that sounds boring like transport fever where your job is to just make logistics lines and like product deliveries happen um why is that fun I don't know <laughs> <laughs> a game I've played a lot recently but so that was really exciting for me is like reading about people that play games and like different games and talking about games and being in the industry but have it just be like normal people and their their career and their world is just video games without yeah. it being like some kind of like sci-fi spin to it. I really, really enjoyed that. Just a sad duck. There is no pun. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we spread. Yeah, you guys have all really sold me on We Spread. It was really good. I just was expecting to like sob. <laughs> I'm going to pick it up when I'm ready to cry. Okay. Good to know. Pioneer's part took me out of the story. Yeah, it was uh, jarring. Definitely different. Emily Blaster sounds like a riot. Yeah, it was very fun. Every time they explained it, too, it was just, like, so violent. I think one of the... Um, someone even commented, like, this is the most violent poetry game and it's just like what a funny sentence i know <laughs> this is a good way to put this pioneers was very abrupt but that was the point yeah that's probably why it, like i was so confused about it happening because i was like wait yeah. how did we get from what we were just talking about to this pioneer part <laughs> um we also probably are 
going to get into spoilers pretty soon here. So if you are still hanging around and haven't read it and want to read it, this is your official warning um, for the spoilers. Also, Mel wor herself works in video games, so I'm excited to kind of hear her take on some of this too. As oh, that's so cool. In the industry, yeah. Um, because I would also love to see someone actually make these games come to life. That's what I thought about too, is like, I would not, I would rather this be adapted into video games, like the video games rather than like a movie or a TV show. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't think of any adaptations really that have done that to an extent. There's been, um, well, maybe there has, there's been a couple, I guess, but it was like, all I could think of is I want the adaptation dollars and muscles to go to making the games. Yeah, I think that would be a, a much more interesting way to use this book for any type of other media. Yeah. Because I don't know if I would watch this as a movie, if I'm honest. No, I don't know how you would really do that. Like the joy of it was them explaining the gameplay. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be a real challenge to get across like visually like that without yeah. getting to like play it yourself. Also glad it wasn't sci-fi. It was just nice to read a normal book that had video games like as an mm -hmm. element. To it. it made me realize how I never have really read that before. And now I want more of it. Yeah, that is a really good point about it not being sci-fi. Um, I think that every time something has to do with video games, they always make it sci-fi, mm -hmm. which I get. Like, I understand that, but it's like, I want to know about the process of making games, not you, like, getting sucked into a simulation of a game. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it was refreshing in, like, the strangest way. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, you're probably gone. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for hanging out. Um, the juicy stuff, looking at our little list that I found, oh, yeah. was just starting us off. Why were they drawn to video games as teenagers at the hospital? What did it offer them? Um, and then why did they want to create games as adults? Um, well, yeah. wasn't Sam's big thing that his grandfather had the Donkey Kong game and that's yeah. kind of like what he was obsessed with. And then them playing games together sort of took his mind off of the situation with his leg and the accident itself and like losing his mom, which you don't really know that in the moment of them becoming friends. Yeah. The way that all that information was delivered was like reverse of how I would have expected it. It was like, oh, two kids playing video games together. And then you learn that he hasn't spoken a word to anyone in like six weeks. And then you learn chapters later. It's yeah. because in that accident, like, oh, his mom died in that car accident he was in. Like you just really buried the lead like several times. Yeah. Um, and video games were just like this, like, like salve, I guess, on that trauma. That just like gave me chills to think about that scene with him and his mom. Like I had, I had to pause for a while after that one. Cause that was like, I think that's when I started really getting into the story and like caring a lot about the characters. Cause I really struggled with, um, Dove as a character. Oh, same. Yeah. I really, really struggled with him and like, especially the lack of consequences for him yeah. just generally. Yeah. Um, and so once I finally got to that point where I was like, this guy doesn't matter. Like it's about these people here. Um, that's when you find out about his mom and that whole accident. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> and what's crazy is like, I live in Los Angeles. So like a lot of the things that they're saying, I'm like, oh, I've driven these streets. <laughs> I know these places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, getting like all of his backstory slowly as little breadcrumbs, like why they moved to LA from this woman, like jumping and landing on the sidewalk in front of them and having his mom be like, yeah, we're moving across the country to them having their like horrible accident. Um, and just like the way it was written was so wild. And yeah. Just, like, so just like, out of nowhere, which is how those kinds of things, I guess, like happen. 
wait, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Living in LA and experiencing the exact shortcuts and whatnot was a trip. Yeah, there's a moment where they go up to California, like the central coast where I live. And they're like, we're guys, we're passing Hearst Castle. You want to go? And I was like, did they just say Hearst Castle in the best? Yeah. Film? <laughs> it's like, that's, that's never happened to me before. They're like talking about the extravagance and particular history of this one place. I'm like, this is, I live here. I know. And it was crazy too, because my coworker was just talking to me about how she went on to go to Hearst Castle, like a few weeks ago. And then I read that I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's like, there's too much happening. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is like a, such a bizarre place to go and tour. Now it just feels like a fantasy castle dropped in the middle of nowhere, but to read about it as a real place in a fictional story really threw me. It was yeah. pretty, pretty insane. We both rated it a four. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Dove's whole purpose in the story is a reality and I just appreciate how much effort Gabrielle Zevin put into understanding the games industry for its bad and good. Yeah, I really felt do you know, Mel, how, like, what Gabrielle Zevin's, like, own experience with the gaming industry is? Or was that purely, like, just well-researched or what? Because it felt very, like, genuine just from what I know about the industry. It felt very well-researched. Yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Um, very much loved it. Very much loved it. Um, okay, so the whole Dove situation, now that we're talking about it, was um, this, like, star of a video game developer who goes to teach a seminar to other young student developers, um, and is just, like, a huge asshole the whole time he's teaching it, with no consequence. Well, and he takes advantage of younger women, like, especially that's, you know, the whole relationship that happens between him and um Sadie. Sadie and the thing that I think got me the most was that she just remains kind of friendly with him yeah there's like a scene at the end where he's like oh yeah but you still get brunch with me every time I'm in LA and I'm like yeah Sadie you do like yeah this. and he even says in that brunch like I'll never forget this line because that's when I was like this man is never gonna get yeah and I, I know it it happens I know like in most um, male dominated industries, it seems to be a real problem. But um, he even says like, oh, you know, I love underage women is basically what he yeah, said. He like is very unapologetic and gross about it. Um, yeah. And then nothing happens. About yeah. And it. he's like, LOL, I've been divorced twice. And it's like, why did you even bother getting married anyway? Why didn't you just stick to being a creep? without involving other people. Right, like he openly is like, oh, I suck as a person, I wouldn't date me. I love college girls though. It's like, ugh, like you scumbag. Yeah. yeah. I'm just glad, I guess like the only thing I can say about it is I'm glad that he wasn't the one that she continued on with, but it was a little frustrating in the, the middle part where like Sadie gets really upset at a moment in time when I think it's like Sam's about to go to surgery or something like that. And she says that she loves him and he like doesn't say it back. Oh and yeah, then, we get it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sam and was an asshole for most of the book too. Maybe that's an unpopular opinion. I did not like Sam um, until like the last 50 pages that I read today. It was like, okay, you're not the worst anymore. But I didn't <laughs> like him at all for most of the book. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's funny because she um, she got obviously very upset about that, realizing in the moment that like, oh, he doesn't ever say that he loves me. And is this like really what our friendship is, blah, blah, blah. And but then she like, I don't know how this story came to be in her mind that he's he drove her back to Dove. Do you, you remember this, like where she's basically saying, like, you're the reason you pushed me back into his arms, essentially. Oh, 
yeah, she realizes once they already move to LA so that he can get his foot surgery and not have it be winter. Yeah. Um, then as she's like unpacking her desk, she finds the game, her copy of Dove's game, which mm-hmm. is a game that she loves and hadn't realized that Dove had like signed her game. And it's, it's like for like the sexiest girl or something like very clearly suggests that they were like a, an item. Mm-hmm. Um, and she connects, like she puts together or thinks that she puts together that um, Sam and Marks would have seen that, like marking on the disc when they played it and then sam pretended like he didn't know that they were ever involved together when he asked her to go see if he would give her their like graphics engine Mm -hmm. um just thinking like oh go ask your mentor if he would do this thing for you because you were his student and then sadie thought well you you knew that we were like together yeah I, i don't know but then it's like I don't think Sam knew that it wasn't a good relationship or how he knew the extent. So like Sadie wasn't necessarily absolved of anything too. Like she wasn't the perfect friend either. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was like, she took a couple of leaps, I think. Uh, yeah. but then Sam didn't really do anything to put her mind at ease at the same time. Um, I, it's funny because like in that situation, I didn't really take sides as a reader of who I agreed with or didn't agree with, because you didn't really know if Sam actually did yeah. that until Mark says like, he would have never known because I'm the one who grabbed the game and I didn't even see that, whatever. Yeah. But, um, it's just funny to me how naive Sam is in so many ways and like how Sadie continuously puts kind of certain expectations on him to not be naive. And it's like Sadie, Right. (laughs) But at the same time, I also completely understand where she's coming from, where it's like, we've been friends for so long. We've been doing these things together that are like changing our lives. You would think at some point you either love me as your best friend or you don't. It can't like in her mind, it was kind of like it can't just be one or the other anymore. Like we've Mm -hmm. gone through too much. So it's hard because like, part of you is like, Sam is so naive, but Sadie's like, yeah, but how long can you be this naive? Right. <laughs> right. And Mark's kind of continuously has to talk Sadie down because Mark's is like, it's just how he is and we love him and it's okay. Like you just have to treat him, you know, how he is without those extra. Meanwhile, Sadie is like, no, like he can be better and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah. that's the constant tension. Yeah. Oh, it was all research, but her family worked in tech her whole life, so she's had the exposure of the industry. But the nitty-gritty gaming industry was research. That's awesome. I really respect that. Because it felt very like natural. Um mm-hmm. I I fully believed that she was an expert. <laughs> um that's kind of a good segue to another question on this list is while they both eventually say I love you, they never became lovers, Sam and Sadie. Why is that? And do you agree with Sadie that they are closer than lovers? Yeah, I mean, I like the fact that they're not lovers. I like the fact that we get this story where they've been through all of these things that in many circumstances and a different author would have pushed them together as a romantic couple. But she didn't do that and I appreciated it because I don't feel like that's the type of chemistry that they had. I think it would have been weird for them to be a couple because I, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I really like when things are platonic anyway, we don't get that very often and they felt very platonic. It it almost felt like a brother and sister rather than this relationship. And so when Sam was going through that moment of being like, Oh, you're going to be with Marks. I don't know if I can handle this. I think I love you. I was like, Sam, come on. Right. Come like, on. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he has that like, like super toxic moment. I think that's when they're at like Hearst Castle where he's like, no, Sadie's mine. And Marks yeah. is like, no, she isn't. You don't get to own 
like people or relationships mm -hmm. um whether you were would have like been together romantically or not she still wouldn't have been yours and just like very patiently explains that to him and he's like whatever i'm gonna cut my hair off <laughs> i'm gonna get really <laughs> yeah that was actually a really funny scene to that me. was really funny where he's like mean? i got cold <laughs> But I just really like, uh, it made me really like Marx even more. I yeah. was on the fence about him for a time. And then when they moved to LA, I was like, oh, okay, I really like him as a character. And then when they do that trip to Japan, I was like, oh, I really kind of like you guys. Yeah, so that was my turn point too. <laughs> Yeah, it was like the the sweet, wholesome, um, responsible, chill guy, and then he's he has like one flirty line, and I was like, oh, <laughs> hello, <laughs> um, Marx. <laughs> oh. The way they continue to think about their games separately, like Maple Town was for Sam versus it being for Sadie's sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was very intricate. Loved it. <laughs> And love the emphasis on platonicism. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank God they never became lovers. I think that would have ended in disaster. There are people that serve a specific purpose in your life. Yeah. I like this. I like this also. And I also liked in the book, even though they were like, very obviously to interviewers and everyone, they were like, we're business partners. We work together. We're friends. We've been friends since we were kids. They do all of these events and are assumed to be a couple. Um, and they have to continuously be like, no, also it's not weird. Also stop assuming that. And they just, it like just never really mm -hmm. clicks for people. I also feel like I like this comment too, because <clears throat> I agree that I think it would have ended in disaster especially because of the way just that moment going back to that moment we were talking about where she felt like sam pushed her back into dove's you know arms and she got into this really toxic relationship again they don't have that type of chemistry they don't have that type of relationship it just it would have felt so forced in so yeah. many ways and also I feel like their relationship had it become like more lovers would have been extremely toxic as well yeah because there's a lot of toxic yeah. moments in their friendship as well so I they think they are that, not super good friends to each other for most of the book they're yeah. like very hot and cold like so literally they just have like period multiple periods of years <clears throat> where they just are completely iced each other um, which is like, how are you? Really, Sam? You're going to have a relationship where you just don't talk to each other. But, oh, we should have been romantically involved. No, no, no. So weird. <laughs> it's so weird. And it's yeah. not those moments of, like, our relationship is toxic because we're so in love with each other and we can't see it. It's like, no, y'all are just, like, kind of shitty friends <laughs> at <Yeah>. times. <laughs> right. But I do love that, like, in the end, how old are they? They're, like, in their 40s. He makes that pioneer game for her to basically be like wow I have been a shitty friend at times but I'm learning that like I can't be that anymore and it's kind of cool to see that in someone who's 40 years old because you know we often get a lot of stories about younger people and I've said this a million times like I really wish that we had stories about older people because I think we would then realize that older people are still learning and growing and going yeah. through these like growing pains, just like younger people. It's just about different things and at different moments in your life. And I love that that was like really shown throughout the story. Yeah. There's even like, they're getting to in their thirties and forties. And there's a couple scenes where they're like reflect on the first games they made together or the things that happened while they were still in college together in their twenties. And they have, such a different perspective on it or are like remembering things in a different way as they're reflecting on it but still have other things that they don't have answers to is like oh yeah you never really figure it out you can only just contextualize the things that you go through as they happen to you it was like a very like a human way i think to read the story mm -hmm. um what else was i going to say about their relationship there's a couple times that sam talks about play as being like the most intimate experience 
And he, I think it's one of his interviews, he says, like, play is the most intimate thing you could do with someone. It's more intimate than even sex. And that's like, what? Like, how could you say that? Like, the interviewer is like, that's so crazy. Um, but then there's, like, multiple points in the book where we see, like, Sam has a two-person D&D campaign with Marks, which is, like, I think even when they talk about that, it's, like, a very intimate thing. And, mm-hmm. like, that word is used. Like, how do you have a two-player D&D campaign? And then when he and Sadie play games together, they play a single player game, but trade the controller back and forth, which Mm -hmm. is like, you have to have a certain chemistry and a certain like intimacy with someone to be able to do that. I just liked the little, I don't know, I guess the evidence that they Mm -hmm. had that like play chemistry and intimacy to like back up Sam being like, no, we do have intimacy. It's just like different on a, on a different level. This is funny. I actually talked to some of my really close friends about this a lot about like platonic relationships and how there's so much intimacy within those that you won't really find in your actual intimate relationships and like how you need both in your life. And that's why I also think I loved the part of this book and where I got the most invested was when she is with Marks, but is still at a a gooder, a gooder, (laughs) a better point with (laughs) a better point with Sam and they're all kind of in this cohesive little moment. It just reminds you how important it is to have all types of relationships. And I think we put too much of an emphasis on romantic relationships being your like number one. But as I've gotten older anyway, I've, I found that like friendships when I find ones that like are really special, I have to put as much care and nurturing into them as my romantic relationships. Totally. And I think that's really, that's also why I really, maybe now I'm like, is this a five star? I'm working with you. I'm like, damn, like I don't even think about this. This is gonna like leave an impression on me. (laughs) Sam, come on. (laughs) Honestly, my thoughts about Sam for 90% of the book was like, please. (laughs) <laughs> he didn't know what he was feeling and quickly associated it with oh is this what this means yeah i mean was that the same time where he like briefly got involved again with a girl from high school where he's like oh maybe i should be romantic with someone and then that like kind of just really peters out i think so yeah that was a weird time but at least she you know, at least she introduced him to weed because he really needed it. Yeah, no, for that. There's a couple times where he just like quietly pulls a joint out of his bag and it's like, okay, g- great. <laughs> Take care of that, that phantom limb pain. <laughs> oh gosh, those scenes were like really just so brutal. The way iconic pain was described, the whole book was like really <laughs> gnarly. I think I maybe have talked to you about it. I have chronic pain. I have arthritis and like other issues. <laughs> and um, various issues. Yeah, varying issues <laughs> having to do with getting old. Um, I I really liked when they talk about it. I, sometimes I can get really triggered by certain chronic pain representation, but this one was like. I feel like the chronic pain was really well done. I don't know. I would love to like hear from somebody who has actually had something amputated, like a limb amputated to know if they felt like it was good representation. I haven't really heard many people talk about that part of it, Mm -hmm. but I felt like the phantom limb thing, like, Ooh, (laughs) yeah, that was overwhelming. Yeah, and I mean, just trying to work through it and have, like, the therapy done for it and just for him to finally be like, you know what, I'll just smoke a joint when this happens is like, damn, that must be pretty brutal. (laughs) Ditto, my guy. (laughs) You do what you gotta do. (laughs) Yes, yes. Catching up, love it. (laughs) The whole social or the media thing, thinking they're in a relationship. They don't have a marketing team. That's literally what my job is. You prep the media and developers or whoever prior to these press meetings. This is, I'm so glad you're here, Mel. This is so interesting. I know. (laughs) So again, from an indie dev perspective, she does such a good job of showing the struggle. Yeah. Well, and also the struggle, it's just reminded me of even though Sadie is the programmer, especially in their first couple games, 
Um, she's not the one who likes to go out and talk about it and do the promotion for it. So, and because she's like one of the few women in the field in the earlier days, everyone just defaults to thinking it's Sam's projects. Yeah. And that creates this tension also between them, even though Sam is like, nope, I'm just the guy. I'm a producer. I'm a partner in the business. But like Sadie Green, Sadie Green, she's the programmer. And they just always gravitate more towards Sam about that kind of stuff. Um, and that is just like so shitty. But unfortunately, kind of how the industry still is. I know. I was going to say, isn't that the damn truth? The men always get the credit. Isn't that the damn truth? Oh, and even just the sexism, like, within the games. Like, she talks to Dove about it a couple times. Um, they talk about it in their own developing a couple times about how, like, um, oh, you just want the experience to be immersive for the player. And Sadie is like, okay, well, it's not for me. Like, yeah. in order for me to be immersed in this game, I have to have the same fantasies, like, as the developer, because they programmed it that way without taking me into consideration. And it's just mm -hmm. like... Yes, Sadie, go, like preach, <laughs> say well, it. Okay, so that brings me to something I think I, I was thinking about a lot for this. So, you know, when they were making the um, first game, she wanted to make the character non-binary. Mm -hmm. And then in the Maple <clears throat> Town game, they then, you know, start doing same-sex marriages and there is this running theme of a lot of the, not only sexism, but a lot of the um, like anti, or I guess just homophobia in general in the game industry as well. And I thought that was really interesting because like Sadie was the one that for a good chunk of it was advocating for these characters to be non-binary, which I thought was really cool because I've never seen a book set in like the 90s, early 2000s, where people were even talking about, yeah, you know, considering somebody non-binary. And then um, I thought it was like so interesting to touch on the same-sex marriages, you know, because we've were, we've been alive through that time, we've lived through it, and to see what they did with that and how she touched on it and like. I mean, the fact of how that escalates is so real. Like it yeah. was so real. It was like overwhelming. I don't know. And it was actually cool because even though it's not said, I feel, I think that both the characters are bisexual. And I was like, okay, I'm living for this. Yeah. I really, I like all these little, you know, because you, I guess like when you think of the gaming industry, even though it's not true, it's just based off what we see and we're constantly fed. You just think of like straight men. Right. And that's just like not accurate at all. Mm -hmm. so I thought yeah. that was like an interesting aspect. There was, there were little like sprinkles throughout. Like mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think Sam at least was, even if he didn't explicitly say it, we, we got you know, some of his experiences. And then um, some of the other characters also, like, well, it was Simon and Ant, like their relationship and their part in the team. Mm -hmm. and I think it was um, Sam's mother is like, we're getting like one of her stories. I think I'm remembering this correctly. And it's like the time period is like the 80s, 90s. And she talks about having like casual sex with one of her like female cast members at whatever yeah. performance she's in. And it's like, okay, Anna, like, great, amazing. And it's just like, it was like a one sentence passing thing, but it was enough for me to be like, okay, I'm I'm loving this. But I really love that. I love when a book is set in a, a time period where, you know, homophobia is obviously still a huge issue, but back in a time when it like was, it was just so ingrained in people to not even talk about the queer community at right. all. Right, pre-internet even, yeah. Yeah, to like have those moments, but for them to be so casual that it's like, this is just normal. This is just normal people living their lives. We don't need to like make this a coming of age about this. It's just like, yeah. that's people living their lives. Yeah. Love and it. it's like even the moment when um, Marks and, what was his first girlfriend's name? Do you remember? Zoe. Zoe, when they're basically all making out. I was like, Oh, yeah. 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 I'm like, okay. <laughs> and it was just like casually, like weirdly healthy, drama free. Yeah. Like make out sesh between all of them. Like, okay, I'm loving this. I know. Yeah. And it just, it like, it happened. They were happy. And then afterwards, it was like, we're happy. Like, it's chill. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Stories about older people. Yes, seeing them transcend time together. Chef's <laughs> kiss. <laughs> okay, I'll have to write this down. Your invitation to be a guest in my book club. Yes, right, the intellectual. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Big librarian energy. <laughs> just, oh god, I'm always. I feel like I have such imposter syndrome about being a librarian, but you know, we'll just ignore that. <laughs> It's okay because Jane and I were talking about imposter syndrome earlier today. I think it's just like maybe tis the season or it's just everyone <laughs> is always thinking about imposter syndrome and never talking about it. And that's just <laughs> the way of the world. Yeah. It's like, am I qualified? Does anyone else feel qualified? I don't think the answer is yes. <sighs> true. That's true. Trying to read this before the live show. Hi, Bree. We are talking about spoilers, but I am glad that you're here anyway. I respect <laughs> it. <laughs> five star, five star. <laughs> 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 uh, so late, but one of your faves of last year. Ooh, early to the party. I guess it came out like last last spring, summer. Yeah, it's so funny because it was an ALC and I just like I thought it was going to be sci-fi, so I just ignored it. <laughs> what a twist. I know. Here we are. <laughs> Most devs don't like talking, though. They hate talking to the press, and consequently, press learn who to speak to for various projects. Like, this makes sense to me. And it feels like, I mean, I don't know if you have, like, certain skills or things that you want to be a part of or don't want to be a part of, like, that makes sense. And yet, I think Sadie had a little bit of a chip on her shoulder, a lot of it justified, but was constantly like, I'm not getting the credit. Like, it's all going to Sam. Like, they're assuming that it's Sam's. And part of it was because she was never involved in, like, talking about it in the beginning. But also, people assuming <laughs> because of the kind of feedback loop and cycle of the industry like oh Sadie Green no she's not the programmer like she's not the developer so it's like I don't know I could see like where she was coming from me snapping an agreement <laughs> <laughs> so on brand with the imposter <laughs> yeah constant nodding I'm nodding <laughs> So the elephant that we haven't talked about yet, oh. Bree, if you're still here, we're about to talk about a big spoiler, just uh, so you're aware, is Mark's, and I, I want to give you time just in case, but Mark's character arc, should we talk about his beginnings and where his character goes? Sure, sure. Yeah, we're <laughs> all ready. Are we prepared? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, how did you feel, you kind of said, how did you feel about Marks when he's like at first introduced when they're at school? I like thought he was so forgettable and like as she starts doing more developing in their apartment, I was like, God, he's kind of annoying. He's just kind of there all the time for me to move into like, wow, love this man. Love him. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And that was really my line of thinking too which is props to Gabrielle Zevin because that's exactly Sadie's line of thought is like I don't like him who is this guy he's annoying like he's taking up my space and to her being like oh I'm obsessed with you let's have a baby yeah. is like, you know, <laughs> like I feel the same about Wait, the <laughs> marks not the baby <sighs> I literally so my partner has read this book like it was one of his favorite books of last year and I got to the twist of this book and I like texted him and I was like this is not happening and then I said she's pregnant <laughs> <laughs> he was like yeah that was a hard one <laughs> it's a, it was a toughie all of those things happening together it's like wow all three of you are happy and friends and on speaking terms and there's a baby and oh that's why um yeah the sucky thing was i them being 
in a different state, like in a photo shoot and not getting to like be there on site or be reachable was like, I think that's what really got me was like, of course the timing is like the, the gut punch. Mm -hmm. Fuck that pregnancy. I knew (laughs) you would feel this way. (laughs) Oh yeah. Do you, I guess anyone, this is for anyone, but mainly Noelle, do you like a, not that anyone likes a pregnancy trope, but are you like very anti-pregnancy tropes? I am neutral, um, especially when it's not romance. Romance books where there's like a surprise pregnancy is like, well, I don't know. But otherwise, it doesn't really bother me. Doesn't yeah, it just depends, I guess. There's been times that I've hated it, and there's been times where I felt like, okay, that really added something to the story, but usually yeah. it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I don't I feel like I guess I'm neutral too because I think in this case it felt almost like I don't want to say a natural progression, but the fact that we were following their lives, it almost felt expected that s- someone was going to start a family. Who that was, I don't, I don't know. But like, I figured it was kind of nat- a progression that would happen in the story. But I did not think it would happen in that way. I didn't either. One because of all the other trauma and everything that goes down with Marx, but also because earlier in the story in the, the, we learn after she breaks up with Dove for the first time, when Sam kind of goes and is getting her out, you know, her depression, that she tells him way later that she also had an abortion after the breakup. Yeah. Um, and is like dealing with processing that through her breakup depression, through like not going to classes, through like becoming friends again with Sam and is just kind of quietly going through this um so then for her much later to decide with the spreadsheet with marks to be like pros cons should we or should we not keep this child have this baby was like i thought an interesting like turn for her character to take in that way yeah I, i wonder if it was like um gabrielle showing that like she is finally in a healthy place and in a relationship that's healthy and like good for her and give something to her life instead of constantly sucking from her because that right. her relationship with dove like was uh really triggering um yeah so awful yeah like especially the handcuffing stuff like i w- it was very i don't want to say it was unexpected but it just was like jarring how yeah. it just felt like this Thing that everybody was navigating around but nobody was really trying to help the situation and I'm like yeah it but I guess that's like that's I'm not trying to stereotype but that's like men in general right like a lot of men don't advocate for women in that way like they don't jump in in these situations like I heard a really I'm not going to get into it because it could be triggering for somebody but I heard a random story the other day where somebody was like praising this guy for doing this thing and I was like, but the way that he went about it was weird. And also, like, why are you praising somebody for doing the right thing? Why right. are you praising somebody for doing what they should be doing generally? And so I think that was really interesting to see that she did primarily. I mean, I guess besides Zoe, there wasn't really any women around. Mm-hmm. So it's funny to me that maybe that was a whole commentary in and of itself is that like they weren't jumping in because they're not socialized to do that. Yeah. Like when they're talking about moving to California um, and Sadie, like somehow it comes up where I think Marx is the one to tell her like, Oh yeah, Sam and I would talk about like you and Dove all the time. Like we were really worried about it. We were, you know, we, we would notice the marks on your wrists and like the bruises on your arms. And, And as a reader is like, okay like this is like your close friend business partner person that you love that you notice all these things happening you talk about how worried you are and then it's like okay 
<laughs> She'll right. figure it out. <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, it was really interesting because I was curious if that was supposed to be commentary in and of itself. Because I feel like the more you talk about this book, the more you analyze it, there's like such subtle things that really are commentary that you just didn't notice in the moment, which is why I'm like, damn, maybe I feel very differently about this book than I initially thought. Because now that I'm thinking through certain things, I'm like, oh, it's Gabrielle. <laughs> Have you read any of her other books? No, but Jared like loved Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow so much that he ended up getting two other ones and read, I think you read this one too. Um, what's it called again? Uh, so the, the other two that I've read is Elsewhere and The Story Life of A.J. Fickery. That one. He read that one and he said that he thought that I would really love that one. I could see, because that one is like all about books. Um, I could see how you would really like that one too. Mm -hmm. I think of the of the three that I've read, my ranking is, I need to reread Elsewhere. It's been a long time. But in my mind, that one is maybe my favorite. Mm-hmm. And then tomorrow, 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 and then AJ Fickery. Okay. But I and think her, I gave AJ Fickery a three, three or a four. Is um that her only other adult book? Uh maybe. She has one more, I think, that I haven't read. I wonder if it's like in her author flap. Mm. Young Young Jane Young, which is maybe young adult or that could just be because it has the word young in it <laughs> um but yeah that's the only one of that list i haven't read um but yeah elsewhere i think is technically middle grade no middle grade or ya and then aj fickery is adult okay. <laughs> unless it's done like shit agreed i've never read a coho me either me either think I will but you know that's Me either <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard time understanding Sadie being good with having a casual conversation with Doe towards the end of the book but maybe that's just me being unforgiving yeah I am really torn about this because on one hand it feels like like how how is he still allowed to be around her and be on good terms with her and on the other hand is this Sadie having like processed and dealt with her own like traumas and emotions and past relationships in a healthy way or is it like avoidance and feeling like he's still my friend he's still this mentor he's still in my industry i have to maintain this relationship and i don't know i don't have an answer i feel torn about it part of me feels like it's the latter one because i think the one thing we learn about sadie especially after mark's dies is that she is an avoider. Mm -hmm. She, she mm -hmm. avoids those big feelings and processing those things. And it wasn't until Sam like forced her to to kind of like process it and acknowledge it, um, she probably wouldn't have. So I'm, part of me thinks it's the latter, big time. <laughs> yeah, which is, um, makes me sad for her. Yeah. Wait, so I guess we never even finished our discussion on Mark's dying. <laughs> right, I know. That's like, okay, we said the words. Um, we were, and we all survived. Uh, <laughs> um, I, like, really loved the, I say loved loosely, I loved the switching of perspectives. I did too. Yeah, I, I think that was, like, a really good choice because you learned so much in those moments and, like, I don't know. It just was heartbreaking. <laughs> it was heartbreaking. The audiobook, that's the only time that there's a different narrator is like that one section. Mm -hmm. And um, super heartbreaking getting his like perspective. And then also while he's like in the coma, um, that whole experience. And there's like a moment where he's like, I must be on some really good drugs. And it feels that way because <laughs> it's like very disjointed. But then you hear... Sadie and Sam and the doctor talking to him through his coma brain and then you'll be back to a flashback or back to whatever bird flying in the sky and um I really love the way that was written but it was very um hard to read 
when you especially like learn how much he loves Sadie and it's not just this thing because you know when they first start talking about their relationship they're kind of like yeah this is just this casual thing what it what it becomes is what it becomes and you I mean you learn in that moment she's pregnant you learn that they wanted to do this they wanted to start a family they really loved each other and were desperately in love with each other and it's like oh my god this is like something way more than you expect, you know? Yeah, that was uh that was an ouchie. That was an ouchie. <laughs> um one of the little details that was an extra little, you know, poke the bruise moment was he's like leaving um or not leaving, but he's in that meeting with these like young game developers while Sadie and Sam are somewhere else. Um, right before the like shooting is about to happen and he thinks he's like okay like on the phone with the lobby and these like young developers he's like evacuate with everyone else I'm gonna like take care of this I want to make your game though and you as a reader is like oh my god please go handle the hostage or like the shooting situation like who cares about this right now but he takes the time he's like it feels like there's something I'm forgetting and he like writes a post-it puts it on the thing, puts it on Sadie's desk. Like, you should look at this. And then it sits there for like over a year before I anyone know. finds it because no one goes in Sadie's office ever again. Oh. I've got, I got chills. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that really, that really all, like the way it all came around again too was really good, but really hurt. Oh, yeah, it does feel like it's in slow motion. Mm -hmm. Slow-mo, yeah. Yeah, and the way he's, like, talking about games, even in his coma state, is like, wow, this was, like, such a part of your life, too. Because, like, he was, you know, he throughout the book, he's like, I'm just the producer. I water the plants, and I throw the parties. And it's, like, at the very end, you see just how important and just how ingrained in his life it all was too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's funny because maybe the pioneers thing is what makes you see this, but um, Marx really is the glue yeah. that holds them together. And in probably so many ways is what kept Sadie and Sam together as friends. Um which is really interesting to think. And that's, I think that's why you see them kind of break apart at that time when she's grieving because Sam doesn't know what to do. <laughs> and he's just so confused on how to handle her going through this grieving process. And he just wants things to be normal. And she's like, I can't do that. I'm also real pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. She's like, I'm kind of dealing with a lot here, you know? Uh, and Sam, Sam does this thing where he like tries to visualize and imagine what Marx would say and like hears it, it through Marx's voice and you really get the the like big brother relationship through Sam's eyes mm -hmm. because that was like I think Marx said like oh it's like I feel like your big brother or something along those lines and then seeing even without Marx there like Sam having to look to him for that guidance and have to hear that advice rather than Sam just think to himself, what should I do right now? Go talk to Sadie. He like has to imagine asking Marx and imagine Marx telling him. And that was um, very powerful. Yeah. I think I just also love, cause this is so close to the end of the book. I just love how the book ends where it began. Yeah, I thought about that too, like so <laughs> closely. And it was almost too clean, but I am willing to forgive it. Like, I, I love how tightly it came around. But I think that kind of ties into, is the first question on this list, where is the it? The title? Yeah, is it about the title? Yeah. Um, I think that really plays into the title of the book, right? I mean, I know it's saying it's borrowed from a Macbeth speech, which makes sense. I, I don't know if you've read Macbeth, but, like, it actually makes sense to a lot of the tragedy that happens here. But... Um, to me, it feels like 
it starting over like that in the end, the way that it began just shows that like their friendship goes beyond all of the toxic ways that they've been towards each other, all of the bad that's happened in their life. It There's always tomorrow. There's always that fresh start. There's always like, we're always going to be there for each other, even if it takes years to get back to that tomorrow. But I don't know. That's what I got from it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you pretty much nailed it. I think a theme of the book is second chances mm -hmm. and multiple chances and the pressure that we put on ourselves to nail it in one chance. Mm -hmm. um, like, even when they're talking about, like, mortality and Marx is dying, Marx has the thought of being like, oh, if only I were playing a game, I could just restart the level and I have infinite yeah. lives and I could do it again differently. Or when Sam is thinking about um, the events that led up to his mother's death, he's like, what if this didn't mm -hmm. start the level in a different way? And this was different. Would she still be alive? Could I have changed that outcome? Like they all think in those ways of having like all these, if I only had these many chances, if I could only redo this, if there was only tomorrow, like it was definitely such a theme of the book. And mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with Macbeth, but I really appreciated those little little inserts mm -hmm. and it being explained to me not knowing Macbeth was like hey dummy the title is a Macbeth reference was like oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks I needed that <laughs> um uh, but yeah no I, I really like those themes throughout yeah I'm I'm curious if like why do you think video games were the central part of this book like why do you think because I don't know how to explain this. The story could have been told, obviously, without the video games. Like, it could have been a completely different thing holding them together, right? And for me, I, I feel like the video game part is interesting in what you were saying about, like, them always comparing things to a video game. Like, what if we had X amount of lives? And it almost makes me feel like she used video games as a way of saying that, like, how do I explain this? When the characters are going through like these really tragic moments, they turn to video games, but also it's like they go into these games wishing that life were, you know, you could reset things. You could mm -hmm. have this many lives. You could save these people by doing X, Y, and Z with video games. What's your take on that? I think I think that's pretty much it is feeling like you have maybe a sense of control, a sense of mm -hmm. escapism. And if it's not perfect, you could start over um, and have that be a, a comfort. I think mm -hmm. for a lot of gamers is that way of like, one of the developers even talks about that is one that, that works on the that like high school game. What was it called? The one they wanted to call Doppelgang or something. Oh, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sadie is like talking to him years after they've like finished that game series and he's like honestly like I love that world more than our world I've spent so much of my life making those games but also like I know I can perfect that world as a developer but as a player it's like satisfying to go in and have everything be just the way you want it or at mm -hmm. least know you have the capability to go through the learning curve and play the game and have that satisfaction of like getting to the end and having a perfect game where you can't have that guarantee in the real world is like, mm -hmm. I think that was the point of it being video games. The only other like framing that I could have maybe seen would be like, maybe like sports because it has a similar element of um, trying again and teamwork and all mm -hmm. of these like kind of like the same like mental landscape. I think you, you have to have with sports and video games to a degree but the other part about it being video games, well, this could have been sports too, was kind of what we talked about earlier with the emphasis on play and having these like platonic yet intimate relationships mm -hmm. um, around like enjoyment and having fun, um, I think was another big piece of it too. But that could have been video games or sports for that matter. Mm -hmm. I'm crying at the thought, yeah. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says, this book ended up being a dedication to Marx. <laughs> um, I think I agree. Marx was my favorite character mm -hmm. and he's the one that we lost. And so I think that I don't think you're crazy for saying that it's a kind of an ode to Marx and what he represented to the story. Yeah.
The other throwaway lines that I loved were ones that indicated the husband wife developers who were selling Marks their game were so desperate to sell it, but we don't ever really know why. Yeah. Yeah, we don't really get... Well, wait, is that the game that they make at the end? Or no, yeah. we don't know, do we? They just like, they're like, we're going to get in contact with them. Oh, yeah, I guess we don't know if they actually make it, but it is the one that they like finally contact them. And uh, they were ye yelled at at first because the guy was like, or the wife calls and is like, oh, my art. And he's like, somebody's dead. We're grieving. Come on. Yeah, she's like, I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, oh, my bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, they do end up like contacting them yeah. to make that game. Yeah. Once they finally go into Sadie's office and they're like, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this looks really cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is the longest I've stayed alive in over a year. Happy to have you. Thanks for hanging. I know. <laughs> Does anyone have any other like thoughts or feel like we have there's things we haven't talked about yet? Um, any other lines or moments? Um, the, I guess the other thing I wanted to know was like for the Pioneer game, did you like the way that, I mean, it did take, me out of it but in the end I liked that it was Sam's way of saying like I love you yeah wow that's so funny Mel just said the exact same thing role playing oh. with Pioneer as they're healing um I loved it I think it felt very them although mm -hmm. I didn't I should have realized when the one guy made the crystal heart thing in the game I should have realized that was Sam um I didn't I knew of course it was uh Sadie and I thought that the characters were like NPCs and that Sam had like programmed a crystal heart for mm -hmm. Sadie to have like an Easter egg. But I didn't realize that was like Sam being like, hey, dummy, like here's your crystal heart from this like role play. Oh, that's not clear enough. Let me marry you from a different character. Um, and I love that she was, he was like, how did you not know it was me? And she was like, you were a woman. <laughs> <laughs> he's like okay like who are, who are you kidding <laughs> it's open ended they're moving forward and you can hope that unfair games continues the legacy <sighs> yeah and the fact that they're where Sadie is like takes the game on like the last page is like here's the game and it's like written what she wants to call it and it's like the what it's like latin or whatever for like game six Mm -hmm. um, because in Pioneer, he had named it the, like, child they had in Pioneer Game 5 or something, and Sadie just, like, he had to spell it out for her that that's what it meant. <laughs> <sighs> um, sorry, the other thing I thought about was the whole, the actual shooting. Did you, I mean, obviously we didn't see Mark's dying coming but did you see the repercussions of what they did in their game coming because they kind of made a big deal about the fact that they started doing the same-sex marriages in the game and they were kind of getting threats and like people saying like stop doing this did you expect it to escalate in that way i didn't expect it to escalate all the way there especially mm -hmm. because then they said like they, they hired security because of it, um, but they were facing like some pushback. They had people canceling their accounts. They, it was coming up in interviews, but I expected, I didn't expect that was gonna come back in the way it did. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I could, I mean, obviously I could connect how that could have escalated, um, but I, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't anticipating that. Yeah. I wish I realized it was Sam literally being there. As both of them, too. Like, that was a sneaky little extra. Where she like, goes to confess to her other friend. And is like, oh my god, you too? <laughs> like, okay, well, that was a little dirty. <laughs> Which of the games from the book would you be most into? I would love to play Sadie's game about running the theater and solving a murder. <laughs> I think I... It, maybe this is the basic answer, but I think my top game I'd want to play was Ichigo. Yeah, 
I mean, I know I said earlier that the Maple Town is one that I would likely be playing because I love Animal Crossing, but I really am very curious about Ichigo. Yeah, Ichigo. And um, what was the other one I said before? Between Worlds that they like worked on so separately and got horrible reviews for, but the concept and everything, I don't know. I think I, <laughs> maybe I'm like pretentious enough to like that game. <laughs> maybe you may never know. <laughs> Also, fun fact, I use Unfair Games as part of my application at my current job, and everyone asked me how, why, but our CEO knew because he read the book. That's so cool. That's so cool. That's awesome. You for me. Wow. Um, thanks, guys. Thank you, yeah. Seth. Uh, this was Thank really you. fun. I'm, like, all fired up. Maybe I will raise this to a five. I'm, I know. I'm I haven't gonna, rated it yet. I'm going to marinate on it. I haven't either. It's not written as stone yet. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see but thanks for reading this really cool book with me yeah Hang thanks for having me okay um do you have anything coming up that you want to tell the peanut gallery about before we go <laughs> <laughs> the silly goosies <laughs> if you want to read red rising i'm doing a read along <laughs> the first we've already read the first book we are on to golden sun and that's pretty much what I'm doing otherwise I'm just in my little corner of the internet being dumb <laughs> I love it I can't wait to see um how you feel about the rest of the series mm -hmm. unless you hate it and then I don't want to know we'll pretend it didn't happen okay <laughs> <laughs> we'll erase star it. five stars <laughs> need to read Red Rising you do Mel, I think you'd really like it. Um, you know, at least the rest of the series. First one, you know. Anyways. <laughs> I'll say I gave it a three stars, so yep. take that how you will. <laughs> um, wow. Our next book for February, which we'll discuss the second Wednesday of March, is Talia Hibbert's Young Adult Romance that just came out. Highly suspicious and unfairly cute with that darling pink outdoorsy cover. I know. Um, I know. I'm obsessed. I can't wait. I like just need like something fluffy in my life. And my guest host for that is Brittany from Literarily Smitten, who has read, I think, most of Talia Hibbert. And I'm very excited. So that will be next month. See you for book club in a few Wednesdays from now. Otherwise, thank you, Steph, for reading and hanging out. And thank you, all of you in the chat, for ringing and ring, reading and hanging out. <laughs> ringing and hating out is what I want. <laughs> <laughs> ringing. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I will see you very soon. Give your dog a squeeze. Love you. Bye. <laughs>